all the time. How many of you are looking forward to spending eternity with the Lord? Hallelujah. Amen. If someone didn't raise their hand, just give her an elbow. <laughs> it's going to be much cooler upstairs than downstairs. Amen. All right. So one thing that we can do is praise the name of the Lord in all circumstances. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter if you're having a good day or a bad day, frustrating day. It's praising the name of Jesus forever. Amen. share this new song that I heard uh, a few weeks ago at this camp I was at in SoCal, and uh, it's called Give Me Jesus. And what's so beautiful about the song is that just seeing 70 students raise their hands in worship and singing Give Me Jesus. And a lot of times we ask in prayer for a lot of things. We ask for health, wealth, uh, friends, anything that we can think of. But sometimes, can we just ask for Jesus, church? just asking for Jesus. So I just want to go over the chorus with you guys. It goes like this. Give me Jesus. Can we say give me Jesus? Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Let's sing that. You can have all this world. You can have all this world. All of the things 
been forever in the pleasure I found looking to your eyes. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. we just thank you for today. We want nothing but you, Jesus. Nothing but your name. The name above all names. I don't want anyone else. I don't need anything else. You are my one thing. You are my one thing. I don't want anyone else. I don't need anything else. You are that church. You are my one thing. 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 Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Breath that 
through the fire in darkest night you were close like no other I've known you as the father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God
name above all names. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. your presence Lord Jesus thank you for this new day and thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence and worship you and Jesus open our hearts and Lord Jesus and praise you for all the goodness that you've given and done in our lives Lord hallelujah and when Satan is trying to distract us with anxiety with worries and with fear Lord just help us to run our race with perseverance and fixing on you Lord Jesus the pioneer and the the perfecter of faith, Lord, hallelujah, that always to remind us that one is in us is greater than the one is in the world, and nothing shall prosper that's coming against us, Lord, hallelujah, and Lord Jesus, we, we, we surrender ourselves before you, Lord, and lead us, Lord, give us the guidance and give us the wisdom and your presence and the peace, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. This time I'm going to invite you to take a seat. Well, good morning, church. How's everyone doing? Good? Everyone is doing great. Working out. All right, good morning. Well, thank you so much for joining us for today's service. We're so excited to have you join us. Uh, how many of you were at the Jung making class? A few of you guys? Wonderful. So, in your weekly email update, there is a slideshow uh, where it has some pictures and some images of our church and some of our visitors making that. So, um, if you know anyone, if you invited someone to be part of that, can you do me a favor? Can you send that to them? And tell them, thank you so much for joining us. And tell them that we can't wait to see them at the next Women's Life Group event. Amen? Amen. So that's going to be a very exciting event happening. Um, so thank you, team, for putting that together. We have an update regarding our Giants Fellowship Night, which is Saturday, August 31st at 6 p.m. We have one more ticket still available for purchase due to cancellation. So uh, anyone here love baseball, we have one more spot for you. If you're praying, Lord, should I go or should I not go? There's a sign for you. 
there's a time for you to go. So uh, if you could please contact Millie. Millie, if you could raise your hand. Millie will have the information for you to get connected and to join us for that baseball game. Um, after the game, there is going to be a fellowship night where we're going to be having some time of worship with Mac Powell from Third Day, and we're going to hear some testimonies. And the very next day, we're going to hear a sermon of how baseball and faith kind of relate to one another. So you definitely don't want to miss the game, and you definitely don't want to miss the next event happening on Sunday. We do have something happening. Um, the first Saturday of September, we're having our church cleanup day. And so that's going to be from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Lunch will be provided for the volunteers. So to sign up, please see Lisa Fong for a head count. Lisa, could you raise your hand, please? So if you could please see Lisa uh, to just uh, register for that, to help with the cleanup, and we'll have a delicious lunch for you afterwards. We also have our women's life group happening September 21st. Uh, that is going to be at the SCOMAs. Um, that is going to be from, I believe, 11 a.m. onwards. Uh, if you could please register by September 15th, that would be greatly appreciated. You can contact Lisa. Um, and Helen and Sarah. There we go. We need to, find, we need to have assigned seatings for everyone. That would be very helpful. Um, we also have Tai Chi with Master Sherman. So Sherman, could you please stand up for one moment, please? Let's get up for Sherman, everyone. We've been having two classes so far, and I believe it's been going wonderful. So if you'd like more information on being a part of our Tai Chi class on Wednesday mornings, look at your weekly uh, email update, and there's more information about that. We also have another physical, fun physical activity that you guys can be a part of. That is our walking group led by Dave. Dave, where are you? Right over there, Dave. Uh, let's get up for Dave, everyone. That is going to be uh, September 14th, meeting at church at 9 a.m., and then going down to Land's End. And so that is going to be another exciting activity we have. Speaking of exciting activities, we have another concert coming up for you guys. And so this is Ryan Stevenson, and he is uh, going to be uh, coming October 2nd and playing some worship, and they're going to have an opening act, which is still yet to be determined. But we want to encourage you guys to be a part of this event. How many of you, by show of hands, were at the Sanctus Real event in, in, I believe, in March? Was that an amazing night, church? Amen. So it's going to be another amazing night here with Ryan Stevenson. We want to encourage you to sign up as soon as possible. Uh, what, what you could do to help me out is by scanning that QR code, it's going to take you to a page where you can purchase tickets. And so if you could do that as soon as you can. One thing that would be very helpful is if we do that early in the event instead of late in the event, because we want to make sure we have enough tickets for everyone. Amen. So if you could scan the QR code and sign up to be a part of this event, it would be greatly appreciated. If you know anyone who is looking to do something on a Wednesday evening, invite them to this concert. And this is a family-friendly concert, so we're going to see if we can try to get child care provided for this event. So please invite anyone who would be interested in just uh, having a great time on a Wednesday night. We also have our food drive that is continually going on. If you look at your weekly email update or contact Fetus, there is more information on how you can be a part of our food drive by picking up food from USF and delivering it to Hamilton House. If you have not already done so, please scan uh, the QR code for our Church Center app. What that app allows you to do is to partner with us in online giving, to be uh, kept up to date on events that are happening here at Full Life. And so if you have not already done so, please scan the code. If you have a Google phone or an Android phone, you can scan that code. If you have something that's trash, uh, sorry, Apple phone, you can have scan that QR code. Sorry, hey, my full phone opens up and closes. Can your phone do that? No, I can't, okay? Um, <laughs> yeah, you can, Apple phones, you can do it once. So if you have not taken the time to do so, please scan that QR code. Sound good? Awesome. So we have a really fun, exciting uh, mixer question for you guys. Since we're talking about the Bible and the Word of God, um, who is your favorite Bible character? I know some of us have been reading the Bible for a very, very long time. We've been part of Sunday school. We've heard a lot of the Bible characters and stories. And so today's mixer question is, who is your favorite Bible character? So we're going to stand up. We're going to mingle. We're going to mix. And if anyone says Judas, Delilah, Lucifer, please talk to me or Pastor Anthony about that after service. All right. So who is your favorite Bible character?
1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone? The Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone? You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? How can we be expected to teach children to learn how to read if they can't even fit inside the building? You talking to me? Oh, what's in the box? You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! I'm Ron Burgundy? <laughs> Any question? Can I get a question for you? Can I get an answer? Yeah, yeah. We were walking to church like this is the day you walk to church on. So that's that's great. Am I on? Can you hear us okay? Yeah, good. Uh, anyway, we are uh, we've been looking all summer long at questions that people have about Christianity, maybe uh, questions that have become stumbling blocks or some of the biggest problems that keep people from faith. Uh, and today we're dealing with our last one. It's the end of the summer. It's the end of our summer series. Uh, so we're going to uh, uh, wrap this up, but. Uh, when it comes to questions, I, I'm a big believer in asking questions, probably to my parents' great annoyance when I was a kid, I'm sure, uh, and yet questions are how we learn. Socrates taught us that, uh, but Jesus did too. People were always asking Jesus questions. He never corrected anybody for asking a question. He, he welcomed that. He used questions himself to teach with, and uh, so uh, speaking of Jesus, when he instructed us to go and make disciples... You know, he wasn't talking to pastors. Mm -mm. He was talking to all of us. All of us as Christians are uh, meant to be able to carry the responsibility of, uh, of, of, of properly handling our faith, being able to explain our faith. And, and, and so this series, my goal is not just to answer questions for your own personal satisfaction, although I do want to do that as well, uh, but I want you to know how to answer these questions when your friends and your family ask them uh, of you. And so you might want to take notes on this. Uh, as we walk through, this is, series is more of a transform the heart by inf uh, informing the mind type of series. So let's get started with it. And today, I want to center on a question that uh, revolves around the Bible. I often hear people say something like this, well, I'm sure the Bible has good things in it, uh, but you shouldn't take any, every word of it literally. And, and I think what they mean by that is, you know, while the Bible has some good things, you shouldn't insist that everyone believe and follow uh, everything in it because there are some things in the Bible that are just flat out wrong. You know, some things are right, some things are wrong, some things are good, some things are bad, some things are historically inaccurate. You know, we don't know what really happened. And then much of the Bible is culturally regressive and promotes certain views that are best left in the past. And so for all of those reasons, good things in the Bible for, to be sure, uh, but don't insist that it be trustworthy and authoritative in everything uh, that it says. So that's the objection. So what do, we, what do we say to that? Well, I'd like to argue this morning uh, that you should trust the Bible. Surprise! You didn't see that coming, right? A pastor at church, of course. Uh, but I want to argue we can trust the Bible in three ways. We can trust it historically, we can trust it culturally, and you can trust it personally. So I'll give you reasons for each of those as we walk through. But first of all, and in, in, in the longest and probably, uh, is historically you can trust the Bible historically. Many people today uh, say that essentially the Bible, and especially the New Testament documents, the gospel accounts of Jesus and what he did, many people say, well, uh, these accounts were concocted by the political winners. The original Jesus, who knows what he was like, but this idea that he claimed to be divine and did miracles and, and, and died on a cross, and certainly that he was resurrected, these ideas... Uh, were invented later by church leaders who were trying to consolidate their power and, and build their, their movement. Uh, you know, Jesus went around teaching about love, but, but we can't know what really happened because uh, they, later leaders, were trying to suppress uh, the evidence that the original Jesus was, was just a human teacher, maybe a great human teacher, but just a human teacher. So it's a very popular argument today. What do we have to say to that? Uh, I want to show you it's not accurate, and I'll show you three reasons why, although there are more, but let me give you three reasons why you can trust what the Bible says 
uh, about Jesus in particular, you can trust that it is being historically reliable. Okay? First of all, the New Testament accounts are written too early to be legends or myths. I want to show you how one of the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke, and by the way, the Bible is divided into two parts, okay? Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament is everything leading up to Jesus, and then the New Testament is Jesus' life and then the aftermath of that. So the first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are kind of biographies of Jesus' life from a little different perspective, and we call those Gospels. So this is the Gospel of Luke, and here's how it begins. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, do you know what Luke is hinging his argument on here? He tells us it's, it's those eyewitnesses. He checked with the eyewitnesses. Jesus, Luke, we don't think, was actually a disciple or follower of Jesus at the time. He comes in a bit later. So he was a historian who went back, and he checked with the eyewitnesses. Luke is saying, even though he's writing 30 to 40 years after the fact, he's saying there's lots and lots of people who actually saw and heard Jesus when he was still alive. Okay? How many of you can remember things that happened in 1989? Nobody over here, I get that. But I don't mean what you had for breakfast, but key dynamics, right? You, we, we remember these things. Okay, that's 35 years ago. Sorry, right? But that's, that's, that's that timeline. So these are these, these, these people. There are people around from that timeline. Now, the Apostle Paul, he was writing even closer to the events than Luke was. Paul's earliest letters were only 15 to 20 years after the events of the life of, of Jesus. And so look what he says. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus, how Jesus, after he died and was erected, appeared uh, to the disciples. And then it says, after them, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, listen to this, most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep, euphemism for death, right? He's saying you can go check with them. See, Paul could not possibly have written in a public document that there uh, in the Christian faith are 500 people who saw the resurrected Jesus, most of whom are still alive. He couldn't possibly say that unless that was really the case. At least he couldn't say it and, and hope to maintain even a shred of credibility. Or Philippians chapter 2. Paul quotes a hymn about Jesus' deity. Okay? Now, if Philippians was only written 15 years after the fact, and Paul is quoting a hymn that was sung in the church earlier, what does that mean? Here's what we can know about that. That Jesus claimed to be God. That the Christians following Jesus worshipped him as God. Right? They were singing songs about it. They talked about his miracles. They talked about his death. They talked about his resurrection from the beginning. From the beginning. Anybody remember the Da Vinci Code? Almost, almost remember. Yeah. Uh, Best-selling book, depicts Emperor Constantine in 325 A.D. We talked about him last week a little bit. Basically decreeing Jesus' divinity and suppressing all the evidence that shows that his original life uh, was just as a human teacher. Now, most people realize that book uh, is a work of fiction. And I've actually got no problem with the novel. I read it. I found it to be a, a pretty good read. Um, but many people tend to think that this idea that the divinity of Jesus was added later on by uh, church politics, many people think that's historically accurate. But it's, it's, it's not true at all, uh, and in reality, it's actually historically laughable. Uh, one historian, a real historian, reading the Da Vinci Code said this, Dan Brown says that the Emperor Constantine imposed a whole new interpretation on Christianity at the Council of Nicaea in 325. This would mean that Christianity won the religious competition in the Roman Empire by an exercise of power rather than any attraction it exerted. In actual historic fact, the church had won the competition long before that time, before it had any power, when it was still under sporadic persecution. If a historian, historian were cynical, you would say Constantine chose Christianity because it had already won 
and he wanted to back a winner. Look, of course, you could write uh, documents 200 and 300 years later after all the witnesses were dead and say anything you want, right? Uh, especially back then. Um, but you couldn't say, hey, Jesus was crucified when thousands of people, both pro and con, uh, were still around who had seen it. If, if Jesus hadn't been crucified, if there hadn't have been appearances of him after his death, if there hadn't been an empty tomb, if there hadn't been these miracles, uh, and a public document went around claiming these, Christianity would have never gotten off the ground. So the, the documents are simply written uh, too early to be legend. Secondly, though, the documents are too counterproductive uh, in their content to be legends. What do we mean by that? Well, the conspiracy theories is, is that the Bible doesn't give you what really happened, but you have what the later church fathers wanted you to believe uh, happened because that's the view that helped them consolidate power and, and build their movement. Okay, well, I have to say, if that's the case, they didn't do a very good job of it. In fact, if they were making this up, they, they just did a pitiful job of it. Uh, if I were making up the story of Christianity, would I include in that story the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus trying to get out of it? Right? Would I include a story on the night before his death of Jesus talking to his father, go, is there any way we could let this death thing not happen, this whole salvation thing? Could I just skip that and move on? Right? Can this cup pass me? Why would I, why would I put God or Jesus on the cross saying, uh, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Right? Those passages are con were confusing and troubling. Uh, they're confusing and troubling today, let alone to first century readers. Or, here's this. If I were making this up, would I put down that all the initial witnesses to the resurrection, okay, the people who first saw Jesus raised from the dead, would I record uh, that they were all women? at a time when women's testimony could not be legally uh, entered in, 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 in court because of their social low status. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all say that the original eyewitnesses were women. If you were making up a story, you would never tell it that way. Not only that, but the leaders of the early church were the successors of the apostles. And when you actually go to the New Testament and you see the apostles, right, on every page, they look like idiots and jerks and, and fools, right? They look terrible. Think about how we talk about the founding fathers of this country, right? Oh, you know, they can do no law, noble, heroic, wise. We'll even argue, well, he wasn't a very good guy. How dare you not be patriotic, right? That's how you build a legend. And yet the apostles might as well be the 12 stooges. The only possible explanation for this being in the text is that it happened. Some of the worst things about Peter appear in the Gospel of Mark that we actually believe is Peter's Gospel, that Mark wrote down what Peter said. He's telling it on himself. See, so they don't help any other way than that. See what I mean by counterproductive? So the New Testament documents are too early to be legends. They're too counterproductive. And then lastly, uh, really briefly, they're too detailed in their form to be legends. And this is actually a secular literary critique of, of the Bible. Uh, uh, we know that the genre of literary fiction in, 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 in the world, novels, short stories, all these things, this was a product that was developed in the Western world primarily in the 18th century. Okay? It's the first time that you have realistic fiction where you, you read these detailed stories and they seem like they're true, all right? We all read this now. Deanna was reading a novel the other night, you know, and you get all into it and you feel like it's true, you feel like you were there. But in ancient times, legends and myths weren't written like that. How many of you in school had to read Beowulf or the Iliad, maybe? You've read these things, right? Or go back and read the Gro Greek and Roman uh, uh, myths. They don't start the way we just read in Luke 1. I went back and talked to all the eyewitnesses, and I want you to have this solid account. No, no, uh, they just don't read that way. I, I quote C.S. Lewis often in here, um, but some of you might not know that before he became a Christian, he was actually a professor at Oxford in uh, ancient uh, mythological literature. And so here's what he says about the gospel. 
I have been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends, and myths my whole life. I know what they are like. I know none of them are like this. Of this gospel text, there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage, meaning, hey, here's what happened. I just wrote it down. Or else some unknown ancient writer without known predecessors or successors suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern novelistic realistic narrative. The reader who doesn't understand this simply has not learned how to read it. A little condescending there at the end, but you don't have to fess with me about that. But here's the point. The Gospels don't have the form of ancient myths and legends. They're written much too early to be legends. Their content is too counterproductive to be legends. So in short, you can trust them. Uh, they tell you what really happened. You can trust the Bible uh, historically. You say, well, Anthony, you just did the New Testament. What about the Old Testament? Well, this is just a sermon, and we have to keep moving. I can tell you, I've studied tons on this kind of stuff over the years, uh, and I can't possibly cover it all in, in 40 minutes. But here's kind of the shortcut to it. Uh, when you consider, once you realize that what the New Testament says about Jesus is reliable, okay, then go back and look at what Jesus thought about the Old Testament. And he saw that as very authoritative. Uh, he took that seriously. And, and so it all comes back around. I can tell you, I only care about the Old Testament for one reason. That's because Jesus cared about the Old Testament, right? And I'm all about Jesus. And so what Jesus was into, I'm into. So, number one, you can trust the Bible historically, okay? That's our first big point. Secondly, you can trust the Bible culturally. What does this mean? I would say that in the last few years, there's actually been a shift where uh, people are more troubled about the cultural aspects of the Bible than they are about the historical. When I was coming up reading about uh, apologetics, how to defend your faith, and I was a lot of emphasis on the historical record and all this. In postmodernism, I find people don't care about that as much. The bigger issue is the uh, the cultural, meaning that people read things in the Bible that they consider uh, offensive, primitive, and, and regressive. And they read these, they go, oh, how awful. We have evolved past these things. It's better to leave that kind of thinking in, in the past. So what are we going to do with, with this one? Uh, first of all, I can't go down and list all of the things in the Bible that offend modern San Franciscans. Okay? First of all, it's just a very long list. But secondly, those things shift you, which is actually one of my points. Instead, I'd like to give you three ways to handle any biblical text that seems to offend you, okay? And, 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 and it, these things that make it maybe hard for you, like, oh, I can't handle this, i got to close the book, and, and not keep on exploring the Christian faith. So maybe you say this, instead of a fish dinner, here's a fishing pole, all right? So here's to teach you the things you can do when you come to a text that upsets you or offends you. Okay, first of all, please consider the possibility that it doesn't teach what you think it teaches. Okay, we need to be patient with these texts. Let's, let's take the book of Genesis, for example. When you actually sit down and read through the book of Genesis, it can be very upsetting, actually, because here are all these spiritual heroes, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? These are the fathers of the faith. And go through there and look and see how they treat women. Mm, no, it's not good. They, they would be skewered on, on Twitter today. Uh, first of all, they practice polygamy. They All of them have multiple wives, which puts the man absolutely in the power seat. Polygamy is uh, an absolute patriarchal, male-dominated uh, 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 dynamic. Uh, they buy and sell their wives. It's a commercial interaction. They're paying the father bride price, all these kinds of things. And you don't have to be a modern feminist to, to be opposed to all that kinds of stuff. And yet these are our examples, right? These are the heroes. So the Bible seems to be promoting these primitive practices and, 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 and more like them. So it's very upsetting. But hold on. Here's the question. Is the Bible promoting that? Robert Alter is a Jewish professor of ancient literature uh, right over at Berkeley. He's at UC Berkeley. And I've been following him for years. He wrote a very influential book called The Art of Biblical Narrative. And in this book, he says there are two institutions that you see in Genesis that were universal in ancient culture, but pretty much despised today. Okay? One was polygamy, 
and the other is primogeniture. The law of primogeniture basically said the oldest son got everything. Are there any oldest sons in the room like me? I don't see as big a problem with this, but apparently people have a problem with, with primogeniture, my sister being one of them. Um, but anyway, all this power, money, basically everything, you know, the oldest son got to rule over all the family. But Alter says when you come to the text of the Old Testament, when you come to the text of Genesis, you see two things. First of all, in every generation, polygamy wrecks havoc. Uh, every time you see somebody with multiple wives, it is a disaster in every way you can imagine. There is no, and they lived happily ever after. No, it's a nightmare. And secondly, when it comes to primogeniture, in every single generation, God always favors the younger son over the older son. So it's always Abel, not Cain. It's Isaac, not Ishmael. It's Jacob, not Esau. And so Robert Alter says that if you actually realize that what Genesis is doing, you'll see that it is subverting, not promoting. It is overturning those ancient patriarchal institutions at every turn. It's being counter-revolutionary. This is our own, I can't call him a native son, I guess, but Mark Twain spent a lot of time in San Francisco. And you may know this, that in the South, certain schools have banned uh, 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 Huckleberry Finn. And the purpose is, oh, because it has the N-word in it. Yeah, but they're not being, dis they're being disingenuous. Because, yes, it has the N-word in it, we don't use that word, but Mark Twain wrote a very pro-egalitarian book. He was using the language of the time to get to that place. But he's actually being subversive of the racism of the day. That's what Genesis is doing. And so when you read it like that, we go, oh, wait, the Bible is actually a countercultural revolutionary text. And we actually love that, right? Especially in San Francisco, we're sticking it to the man. And, and this, is what, this is what the Bible is. But, but here's the thing. What if you never read Robert Alter? And so you just took it at face value, and you just assumed that the Bible was promoting these things. And so you, you dropped it. You never got past Genesis. You never got past the Old Testament. You never got to Jesus. All because you assumed that the Bible was promoting these paternalistic, regressive ideas and, and practices. So first, please consider that the text might not actually be teaching what you think it's teaching. That's the first thing. Number two, please consider the possibility that you may be missing something because of your own cultural blinders. Okay? We all have cultural blinders. We don't see them because we're in our culture. By the way, I would highly recommend that when you are in your 50s, you pick yourself up and move to a completely different culture maybe even a different ethnic group, and pastor that group and learn all of these things. It's amazing what we, I'm reading a book. This is sideways, but with, I, I'm reading a book on the history of, of Chinese immigrants in America. And I got to this place a couple weeks ago where it said, uh, and they, you know, these immigrants are coming to uh, mostly San Francisco and they're having to adapt to all these white customs and this one and this one. And none more than this peculiar white custom of shaking hands. So I was like, wait, what? That's a white thing? Chinese don't shake hands? And I realized something. I've been out front of the door every week going, hey, how you doing? Sticking my hand out. And some people were like, mm, long past. Because in Texas, if I don't shake your hand, that's the rudest thing I could do to you. If I don't stick out a hand, they're like, pastor, then, you know. And then I realized, oh. So I've had to like, okay, wait a minute. Now I'm like, I'm in hell with you. And then. And then if you shake my hand, I'll go, hey, I got a summer hug or something. But there's these, we have cultural blinders on, right, in every dynamic, okay? So in the Gospel of Luke, classic story that illustrates this, and it's actually a pretty funny story, I think. Uh, but later in the day on that first Easter, uh, it says some of the disciples were walking along the road uh, to Emmaus. And, uh, and these disciples were discussing the things that had happened that weekend, right, the crucifixion, all these kinds of things. And it says all of a sudden, Jesus came along, and started walking with them. Only here's the thing. They didn't recognize that it was Jesus. Somehow in the resurrection body, we get to be shapeshifters and things. I don't know all of that. But, but Jesus was able to, on several occasions, make it where people couldn't recognize it was him. And so he says, hey, guys, what you talking about? And, and look at it. This is Luke 24. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? 
and they stood with their faces downcast. One of them, them, named Cleopas, asked, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? He's going, what, are you living under a rock? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Wow. Right? And I love this. Okay, first of all, Jesus is all poker face, right? It's all a joke. He's just trolling these guys. Uh, but do you see why they're missing they misunderstood the prophecies about the Messiah because of their cultural blinders. As, they, as Jews, they were only thinking about the Messiah in terms of the redemption of national Israel. They weren't thinking about the redemption of the whole world. They certainly weren't thinking about redemption from the powers of sin and death itself. And so they had a narrow perspective that they brought to the prophecies, and therefore they misread them. See, that's why they couldn't make any sense of what Jesus had done. But he's going to do the same right here next time. In the same way, I want you to consider how easy it is for us to do the same thing. To read a passage of the Bible through our cultural blinders and therefore misunderstand what it's actually teaching. And I'll, I'll give you one case study. Uh, and it's, uh, I think, probably the one that comes up today more than any other one that I uh, come across. Uh, it's at least the one I hear the most. Slavery. I can't tell you the number of times that people have said to me, well, uh, the Bible condones slavery, and that was wrong. So who's to say it's not wrong about this also? Very often people will start with that uh, as a premise and then go on to challenge biblical authority. But I want to ask a question. Does the Bible actually condone slavery? Of course it does. I mean, look at these passages where Paul says, slaves obey your masters, Right? Open and shut case. There it is. He condones slavery. But if you actually go to the one book of the New Testament where Paul addresses masters and slave, that relationship, he talks to Onesimus, the slave. He talks to Philemon, the master. And if you read it, you begin to realize, wait a minute, this is something more like indentured servitude going on here than what we think of as, as slavery. And that's the point, see, because when you and I read the word slavery, we immediately think of 17th, 18th, 19th century New World colonial slavery, race-based, uh, African, Kunta Kinte from roots, slavery. But when you read about slavery in the Bible with those cultural blinders, we're not going to see uh, the true picture. How much do you actually know about first century slavery in the Greco-Roman world? The slaves that Paul was actually talking to. Did you know, by the way, that slaves were not distinguishable from anybody else in that society based on race, speech, or clothing. Just walking down the street, you couldn't tell one from the other. That they looked and lived like everybody else and never segregated off from society in any way. Did you know that slaves were generally more educated than their masters and many times had high positions of uh, uh, managerial uh, responsibility? That from a financial standpoint, slaves actually learn, earned the same wages as, as free laborers which meant that they could actually accumulate capital and, and eventually buy themselves out. In fact, did you know that very few slaves in the ancient world were slaves for life, certainly not passed on to another generation. In fact, most of them bought themselves out of slavery within 10 years or, or, or by their early 30s at the latest. You didn't meet a lot of old slaves in there. And, and those all come, by the way, from secular historical sources. Does that sound like the Civil War slavery that we studied in school? No. New world colonial slavery was race-based, and its default mode was slavery for life. Also, the African slave trade was, was begun and resourced through kidnapping, which the Bible explicitly condemns in 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 11, and Deuteronomy 24, 7. Therefore, while the early Christians, okay, like St. Paul, facing first century slavery, they discouraged it. He, Paul's always saying to slaves, hey, get free if you can. But he didn't actually campaign to end it. But 18th and 19th century Christians facing New World slavery absolutely did work for abolition. And, 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 and because why? Because it could not be squared in any way 
with biblical thinking. So the point is, when you hear somebody say the Bible condones slavery, you can say, no, it didn't. At least not the way that you and I define slavery. It's not talking about that. Oh, but you say, but Anthony, didn't people in the South use those passages? Slaves obey your masters in order to subjugate African slaves. Yes, they did. And believe me, I probably know that story better than you do. I grew up in the South. I undergraduate history degree was in antebellum South history. Uh, but I would say that actually proves my point because they were reading it through their own cultural blinders too, and it was an absolutely illegitimate twisting and perversion of what the scriptures taught. So therefore, please consider the possibility. And I could give you a ton of other illustrations besides just slavery, but this is a big one. That when you read something in scriptures and it seems offensive, uh, at least recognize you are reading it through your cultural blinders. So first of all, you might be reading it wrong. Secondly, you might uh, just be interpreting it wrong because of your cultural blinders. But thirdly, please consider the possibility that you may be missing something because of your own cultural arrogance. See, we tend to have, all of us, anywhere in the world, we tend to have an unexamined sense of superiority about our place and our time in the world. We think that where we live and when we live is better than anybody else's. So we read a passage and we say, well, that's just awful because it's a problem in uh, our culture. But in other places of the world today, and I have visited there, I have preached in their churches, I've interacted with their people, uh, well, that passage that we just didn't like is fine. And other passages are a problem for them that we don't see any issue with. They're having trouble with that. So, for example, in Western individualistic societies like ours, we read the Bible, and maybe what it has to say about sex is a problem for you. Oh, how old-fashioned. Okay? But when you read about what the Bible says about forgiveness and loving your enemy and turning the other cheek, you go, oh, how wonderful. Yeah, let's just live at peace with everybody. And, you know, yeah. So we're, we're down on the guilt thing. So sex, boo. But forgiveness, yay. Okay. But go to the Middle East. Let them read the Bible. Okay? What the Bible says about sex sounds pretty good to them. Probably not strict enough. But what the Bible says about forgiving your enemies sounds absolutely crazy. Are you kidding? We'll, we'll get killed if we do that. You'd be destroyed. Because that's not an individualistic society. Uh, it's a shame and honor-based society. And so that's just not how things work there. So let me ask you a question. If you are offended by something in the Bible, why should your cultural sensibilities trump everybody else's? Right? Do you see what I mean by cultural arrogance? Just do a thought experiment with me. Okay? Well, if the Bible was the revelation of God, and, and, and it wasn't just the product of one culture, but God came uh, down and, and, and delivered the word of God to all peoples, all cultures across all time periods. Okay? Well, wouldn't it contradict every culture at some point? I mean, every culture is different, right? So wouldn't it have to offend your cultural sensibilities at some point? And therefore, when you read the Bible and find some passages that are outrageous and offensive, that's actually proof that it's really true, that it's probably from God. Um, and, and by the way, one last thing real quick on this point. Do you realize that your great grandchildren, if you have any, are going to think that a lot of the things that you believe right now are absolutely embarrassing. Just like there are things that your grandparents believe that you're uh, 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 ashamed of now, that you're embarrassed of now. Listen, when my parents were in college, that's not ancient history, all right? Black people and white people could not live in the same dorms at my University of Texas. Okay, that boggles my mind. And so here's the trick, of course. The trouble is we don't know which of the beliefs that we hold today are going to look ridiculous in the future. And so therefore, if you allow your cultural biases to sit in judgment on the Bible, you might be missing out on all that Christianity can give you, all that a relationship with Christ would mean to you. Why? For a belief that in 50 years may be a laughing cracker. Look, when we be humble, this is the point. Let's be humble. 
So, first of all, you can trust the Bible historically. Second, you can trust the Bible culturally. But then thirdly, you can trust the Bible personally. And, and so it's often hinted, sometimes it's said outright, that, that people that take the Bible really seriously, that take the Bible in an authoritative way, where this is going to set the boundaries for their life, that those tend to be kind of cold, legalistic type of, of faith people. Um, and, and of course it can be. But I'd like to make the case, as we wrap up, that a completely authoritative view of the Bible is actually the prerequisite to a warm personal relationship with God. It's not the enemy of it. For example, let's go back and look again at our Emmaus Road uh, story and their surprise meeting with Jesus. Remember, they didn't realize that this was Jesus who was walking along the road with them and, and trolling them about all these things about himself. And, and they're sad because Jesus didn't turn out to be who they thought he would be. And so he says to them in Luke 24, verse 25, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Prophets, by the way, meaning Old Testament. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So he gives them a little Bible study, okay? but they still don't recognize it. And then uh, he stayed and he had dinner with them. And while he was at the table, he uh, kind of does a little communion thing. He takes some bread, takes some wine. They're like, oh, wait a minute. And suddenly their eyes are opened and they realize who this was. And then poof, he vanishes. A weird story. I'll give you that. But I want you to see what they say after he leaves. Okay, this is their forehead slapping moment, all right? Oh, verse 32, they ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked about on, on the, when he talked on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And the Greeks say that word that's used there for our hearts burning within us means an uncontrollable desire for something. All right? And so here's what they mean. They had a completely life-changing personal encounter with the Lord. They felt a love for him they had never felt before. When? When he explained the scriptures properly to them. That's the way into a deep personal relationship with God is to truly understand what the scriptures say about Jesus. See, what did he say to them? He said, you've misunderstood the scriptures, fellas. Well, why did they misunderstand? It's verse 27. Let me tell you something. The Bible will crush you into the ground unless you understand verse 27. This is a big part of our problem today in the church with we don't know how to properly interpret Scripture. Because verse 27 says, In beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures, what? Concerning himself. What Jesus is saying there is everything in the Bible is about me. Beginning with Moses, that's the first five books of the Old Testament. And all the way through the prophets, it's all about me. If you think the Bible is all about you, okay, about how you must live, and about how you must think, and about how you have to do everything in order to get blessed, well, guess what? You don't need a Messiah. You just need the rule book. And then follow the rule book. But there are two ways, by the way, and only two ways to read the Bible. Okay? You can read the Bible as if it's all about you and what you must do. Or you can read the Bible as if it's all about Jesus and what he has done for you. Two ways. Is the Bible about you or is it all about Jesus? So to close out, let's do what Jesus did that day, beginning with Moses, which is all I've got time to do. I can't take you all the way through it. No, I can take you all the way through it. I won't, not this morning. Um, stick around. This is what we're going to do for the next 10 to 15 years. I'm going to take you through every part of the Bible and show you. Like the next series we're doing is going to be on the book of Habakkuk. You ever heard of Habakkuk? Some are like, wacky Habakkuk. I don't even know. Yeah. Weird book to start, but I'm going to show you how Habakkuk's all about Jesus. And how in this moment, if we'll understand that, it'll, it'll help us and we'll study it, okay? But let's look at Moses. Look at Moses. Look at the Passover. Look at the Exodus. What is all that about, okay? Is it about you? Is it about how, oh, you got to be faithful like Moses was faithful 
Uh, you you got to be brave so that you can face down the pharaohs of this world, and, and you got to be a good leader so you can lead the slaves to, to freedom. Is it all about you? Is that what the story's there for? No. If you really listen to what that scripture is saying, you'll see that God did not come to Moses and say, oh, you are such a good man. You know what? You deserve to be a leader. And because you're really faithful to me, because you, I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments, you're going to keep that perfectly, I'm, I'm going to let you lead the people out. No. Here's what God says in the Exodus. Listen, you all deserve to die because of you. So here's what we're going to do. You take a little lamb, and you slaughter that lamb, and you take its blood, and you take the blood from that lamb, and you go put it on your house. Every one of you, you put that on the door of your house, and then when the angel of death comes down, he will pass over your house, and you won't have to die for your sin. Now, if you read that Passover passage, that's Exodus chapter 12, if you read that as if that's all about you, what do you say? Well, we better get it right. We better do just what God says. But listen, can you imagine what must have happened on that road to Emmaus? What happened to those disciples' hearts when Jesus showed them that passage? He goes, guys, do you really think that the holy God of the universe put away your sins because of those sweet little woolly lambs? Guys, I'm the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. I, I, I am God himself come into the world to absorb uh, 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 all of sin into myself, to pay your debt myself so that you and I can be together for all eternity. That's how it works. Listen, you come in here on Sunday mornings and you sit and you take notes for a little bit and, and, and you know, maybe you go someplace else and do that. And it's kind of like a lecture in school. I'll be honest with you. It, it is. And it's informative and all those things. But at some point, hopefully, when I show you that this is all about Jesus, then it becomes a sermon. There's a radical difference. And, and, and suddenly, it moves from just getting information into your head to transformation in, in your life. Because Jesus says, listen, the Passover, all of it, it's all about me. I'm the lamb. I've done this for you. What happens then? It, it gets personal. See, now it becomes not just information. It becomes a, an encounter. You, you, you want him. You, you sense his presence. Maybe even now. Guys, it's all about Jesus. That, that rock in the desert, and you strike it with the rod, and the water comes out. Guess what? That's Jesus. It, all of it. Jesus is the tabernacle. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the, the sacrifice. Jesus is the altar. He is the light. He's the bread. He's the prophet. He's the priest. He's the king. It's all of it about Jesus. It's not about you. It's all about him. Isn't that good news? Yeah. And doesn't that make you want him? Don't you begin to feel your heart burn? See, you, you have in your heart a longing for a purpose, a longing for an infinite love, an infinite significance and security that nothing in this world can possibly have. Your heart will not be satisfied until your heart finds its place in Jesus. And the way to find him is when you realize that some particular text is, is, is about you. That's understanding it. But it's not just understanding that it's all about Jesus. You still have to see it as all authoritative. If you want that personal relationship, you have to see it as all authoritative. What does that mean? It's the authority. You have to submit to it, not it to you. Why? Okay, let me see if I can explain it this way on our way out. One of the ways that I know that my wife and I have a really good personal relationship uh, is that we argue and fight. It's true. We, 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 we do. Isn't it, it, anybody ever seen the movie The Stepford Wives? You ever that movie? They made an old one and they made a new one, right? And, 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 and the wives never talk back, right? Isn't that the dream, guys? You just put the microchip in, and there's never any more contradiction, never any more, yes, dear, look, I've made you some wonderful June. What, you know, what, right? right? Because what? You no longer have a wife. What do you have? You have a robot, see? Now, what happens if you eliminate everything from the Bible that offends your sensibilities, 
or, or, or contradicts or conflicts with your will, right? So I like this part, but I don't like that part. I'm going to obey this part, but I'm going to ignore that part. Let me ask you a question. How does your God ever contradict you? See, how could your God ever tell you something you don't like? He can't. Because what? You've got a step for God. In fact, you don't even have a God. You just have a bigger version of yourself that, that you have created, a larger version of you. So only if your God can say things that outrage you, that make you struggle. One of the great metaphors of the Bible is wrestling with God. Just as in a real friendship or marriage, only then will you know that you've gotten hold of a real God and not just a figment of your imagination. See? So an authoritative Bible is not the enemy of a personal relationship with God. It's actually a precondition. The person who had the greatest relationship with God was who? Jesus. Of course. And you say, well, yeah, he was God's son. I know. But listen, he came and he became a human being for our example. And Jesus bled Scripture. It was constantly dripping out of him. Right? Go read it. How did Jesus confront, contend with Satan in the desert when he was tempting him? It is written. He quoted Scripture. What, what did Jesus, you know, it, it, when he confronted the death on the cross, he quoted Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you? When you cut Jesus, he bled Scripture. That's how he had the relationship with God that he did. That's how he became who he was. And he shows us the kind of relationship with the scripture that we've got to have if we want to have that same intimate uh, relationship with the Father. Do you want the deepest longings of your heart to find their rest in a personal encounter with God? Let me tell you what you do. Go to a place where the scriptures are expounded, a.k.a. church. Okay? Hey, it's great to listen to worship music. It's great to do those things. But you need the word of God to come alive to you on a regular uh, basis. Go to Bible studies where people get together and talk about what do you think this means? How does this work out? Make sure you personally spend time in it as an individual. Eat the book. You can trust this book. We're not our hearts on fire as he expounded these words to us. Let's pray. Father God, that's my prayer. First of all, thank you. Thank you so much for the Bible. It's, it's a miracle. I, I, I could go in. I could, I, maybe one day I will. I could do a whole series on just the nature of the Bible itself, how special it is historically, literary. It, it, it's unique in so many ways, and we're grateful for that. And, and I believe that you've caused that to come down to us uh, throughout history in different ways and, and, and to every culture that I can go and, and I can preach to people in Africa and I can preach to people in in, in, in Singapore, I've been there, preached people in Europe. Many times I've preached there, people in Mexico. Vastly different cultures. Some, some at war with one another, and yet, one gospel, one truth, one holy word of God that convicts all of us of sin, sometimes in different ways from one culture to the other, but it's all of us. God, what I'm thankful for even more than the Bible is I'm thankful for your Holy Spirit the living Holy Spirit that comes and allows us to read the Bible. You said, Jesus, that you would send your Spirit and he would remind us of everything that you've taught us. So, Father, we need, first of all, we need that Holy Spirit in our lives. And the way we receive your Holy Spirit in us is when we become followers of Jesus. That's what you promised, Jesus. You were going to leave. You were going to send your Holy Spirit. So the first thing, anybody in this room, who's yet to become a follower of Jesus. You're not going to understand it from an insider perspective if you're not an insider. And the way you become an insider is to simply say, Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are the leader of my life. I, I, I don't want to be the leader. I want you to be the leader. I am submitting myself to your authority. I believe that you will speak to me. And one of the ways that you will speak to me is through the authority of the Word of God. I want to humble myself, and I want to know that I don't know everything, but Jesus, I believe that you do, and I'm asking your Holy Spirit to come into my life and illuminate your truth to me. Paul says if you confess with your mouth, and the second thing, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You must believe the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's all about that. The one stumbling block I cannot remove. Even if 
Paul said, if Jesus is not resurrected, nobody's a bigger fool than the preacher. It's a waste of my time. But I bet it all on the truth of the gospel. Some that I take through faith, most that I take through faith. And yet you didn't leave us with the truth. You left us with witnesses. You left us with historical theology that was handed down from generation to generation. So thank you for the church. Thank you for the word of God, the Bible. Most of all, thank you for your Holy Spirit. I pray that all of us, whether we become a Christian or not, if, if we're already a Christian, that we would invite the Holy Spirit in to open our eyes. Let our hearts burn within us as we open the word of God. Maybe for some of us, that's not happening because we're just not opening the book. I pray that we would change that. Father, today that you would speak to some hearts about, I need to get serious. They can come talk to me if they need a place to start reading. But that this week they would begin a habit of continually consistently reading the Word of God. But then, God, that others are not getting it because we're not stopping beforehand to invite your Holy Spirit. Open the eyes of our hearts. Read these texts. Let this be true of us. We'll always be a people of the book because we are a people of the Spirit. We are a people of the Spirit. Thank you for this. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, hey, thank you guys for being here with us uh, today, and we're going to wrap up. Let you get out and enjoy this beautiful day. I can't wait. I'm going to Golden Gate Park today to take my dog, and uh, probably my wife, if she wants to go with me. Sometimes I walk too far for her on Sundays, but anyway, it's a beautiful day. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, do come out if you'll join us Tuesday night for prayer meeting, 8 to 9. We take time to let the Holy Spirit percolate in these things in us, and uh, so we'll be doing that again uh, on Tuesday night, and then uh, if you can make it to the ball game, if you didn't get tickets, they're uh, I just they're having some flash sale through tomorrow of like ten dollar tickets to all the games next weekend and all through September. They're saying it's because Matt Chapman hit ten something, but hmm. they cost the season ticket more than that. But that's you know now they're just. Uh, but if you're like I didn't get tickets for the group, you can still get tickets and you know maybe wander over and find some empty seats by us or something, but. It'll be fun either way. And then, yes, next Sunday, I am going to preach a message uh, tying baseball and faith together. It's actually not as hard as I think. My bigger, I'm reading a couple of books, and I'm like, my bigger challenge is, is gener you know, getting this down in, in, into one thing. So it'll be fun. Uh, great time to bring friends, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of it in terms of being very, uh, uh, very secretive and, and that kind of thing. So anyway, thank you for that. Uh, as you go today, remember three things. God loves you very, very much, made you special, and has a special plan for your life this week. Go in the grace of God.